Welcome, welcome, welcome. Glad you are with us, whether online or in the room. It's a joy to have you. My name is Matthew, one of the pastors here, and uh, it's an honor to open up some scripture with you today. So if you would, join me in Matthew chapter 14, the gospel according to Matthew chapter 14. If you want to follow along digitally or maybe take some notes, there is a QR code on the screen that you can scan and it'll take you to a spot online where you can follow along. Take some notes if you'd like, email them to yourself, but follow along and participate today and engage with us. Matthew chapter 14, this is a, one of the most, probably uh, one of some of the most famous kind of events and encounters that Jesus has in his life. Things that even if you're not a person who is really, really familiar with scripture or been to church much in your life, you, you've likely heard uh, some form, maybe even of satire, trying to talk about this, this event that Jesus uh, and the disciples experience and walk through. Um, Matthew chapter 14, though, is where we're at, and we're going to unpack it a little bit, and I believe God's going to speak some things to your life and to your heart today um, that are going to help you move forward in life. Matthew 14, we're going to start in verse 22. It says this, immediately after this, what had just happened? Jesus fed 5,000 people. That's what we looked at last week. Over 5,000 people. Everybody was finishing. The day was ending. And it says immediately after this, Jesus insisted or he commanded or told his disciples to go back into the boat and cross to the other side of the lake while he sent the people home. After sending them home, Jesus went into the hills by himself to pray. Night fell while he was there alone. Meanwhile, the disciples were in trouble. Somebody say, dun, dun, dun. The disciples were in trouble far away from land, for a strong wind had risen, and they were fighting heavy waves. They were fighting heavy waves. About three o'clock in the morning, Jesus came towards them, walking on the water. When the disciples saw him walking on the water, they were terrified. In their fear, they cried out, it's a ghost. Must have been October. Uh, verse 27, but Jesus spoke to them at once. Don't be afraid, he said. Take courage. I am here. Say that one more time. Take courage. I am here. Then Peter called him, Lord, if it's really you, why don't you tell me to come to you? walking on the water. Yeah, come on, Jesus said. So Peter wet himself and got out of the... No, I'm just kidding. It doesn't... <laughs> just... It was a ghost. Now it's Jesus. I'm about to get on top of some water. I'm a little nervous if I'm Peter. So Peter went over the side of the boat, walked on the water toward Jesus. But when he saw the strong wind and the waves, he was t -t 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 terrified and began to sink. Save me, Lord, he shouted. Jesus immediately reached out, grabbed him. Oh, you have so little faith, Jesus said. Why? Why did you doubt me? When they climbed back into the boat, the wind stopped. Then the disciples worshipped him. You really are the son of God, they exclaimed. After they had crossed the lake, they landed at Gennesaret. When the people recognized Jesus, the news of his arrival spread quickly throughout the whole area, and soon people were bringing all of their sick to be healed. They begged him to let the sick just touch at least the fringe of his robe, and all who touched him were healed. This is the word of the Lord. Let's pray. Lord, we say thanks be to God for this truth, for these words. So Lord, I pray that over the next few minutes you would help us have faith. Give us ears to hear, eyes to see, and a heart fully ready to receive what you want to say to us today. We pray this in Jesus' name. And everybody said, amen. What's the worst storm you've ever lived through. 
This is the worst, worst one that you can remember sitting there thinking, man, this is pretty intense. I remember it was uh, 2002, 2003, around May, and I was uh, in my second year of Bible school, and we were on a ministry trip. Um, uh, traveling up and down I-44 and Highway 49 from Tulsa to different parts in Kansas and and Missouri. And we were on a a trip. And on our way home, uh, the skies started to turn a a little bit of a different color. Uh, Winds started to to change. There were some sirens that were in the back of ground of what was happening. And what we were about to encounter over the next several hours was a strand of over 10 days different tornadoes that touched the ground all along the right near our travel way on the way down. We, we at one point got out of our bus, uh, ran with about a hundred other people, huddled as high as we could underneath overpasses as tornadoes touched down and skipped around and watching them in the distance and helping the elderly climb this steep incline as people are crying and screaming and wondering where kids are at and save my dog and what happens if we die and like pandemonium was happening. It was intense. When storms like that rage, sometimes people say, ah, it's an act of God. And I think that on one hand, it seems like we need to understand that, that, that God created all things. He sustains all things. He, he is sovereign over our world. It, it's kind of, kind of true. Um, but I think we mix in like Greek mythology with Christianity a little bit. And somehow we have in our minds that God is upstairs like doing like his best Bruce Almighty or Hercules. Like just shooting thunderbolts at people for kicks and giggles. And every time it rains, God is crying in heaven and it's thundering because the Lord is tapping his foot in the sky. Have you ever heard these phrases and things before? No, just me, just oversaved people like me hearing weird things. That's, that's cool. The reality is this, that this scripture that we just read, this truth, this encounter, this Event in Jesus' life and the disciples' life is recorded, and it's important for us to understand some truths. And, and I want to take a few minutes and give you a few observations from this text, and then spend the last few minutes together giving us some practical kind of applications, some take home things that we can do and learn from this passage as well. Here's the first observation I think that we would be remiss if we didn't acknowledge this truth is that Jesus is the King who reigns sovereign over nature. Jesus is fully God, and he was fully man. You think all the way back to the, to the narrative and the, the poem of Genesis 1, where it says, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. When you get into understanding some of the Hebrew, and you begin to understand some of these things, in fact, our friends at um, thebibleproject.org have a free course you can take just on chapter 1 of Genesis. It's phenomenal as it relates to, to the breakdown. And if you're a bit of a science geek, and you're kind of wondering how all this worked, and how did God create, and what does that look like, I encourage you to go check that out. In the beginning, God created the heavens the spance and the earth. In the beginning, let me say it another way, God, who is outside of time, matter, and space, created time, matter, and space, from which everything in creation was then later formed and fashioned. God created the form throughout the world, and then he created function from within the form. And the Bible, how do we know that is true? I believe it's because in verse 2 it says, And the Spirit of God hovered over the darkness. The, the, the vast expanse of the universe. Time, matter, space. Everything that God would later create, he created from those things. It was time, matter, and space. Jesus was in the beginning with God, creating as God. That's what John chapter 1 tells us. Look at Colossians chapter 1 verse 15 and 17. It says this. It says Christ, Jesus, is the visible image of the invisible God. If you want to know what God the Father is like, if you want to know more about the Holy Spirit, look at the life of Jesus. 
If you're new to following Jesus, new to studying this, new to, new to church, start reading the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, and get to know Jesus. Because when you know Jesus, then you begin to know God. And if you're starting with assumptions and cultural things and, and your own perspective of what you think God is, you're likely forming God out of an image of an earthly father that may or may not be a good place to start. I will tell you the best place to start in understanding God is with God himself and the person of Jesus. Christ is the visible image of the invisible God. He existed before anything was created and is supreme, sovereign, reigning, having dominion, authority, and power over all creation. For through him, God created everything in the heavenly realms and on the earth. He made the things that we can see and the things that we cannot see. That's right. There is more going on in our world than what you can see with your own eyes. Such as thrones and kingdoms and rulers and authority in the unseen world. Everything was created through him. And for him, he existed before anything else, in case you missed it the first time. And he holds all creation together. Might I suggest that anywhere we see creation feel like it is being ripped and falling apart, imagine what it could have looked like if Christ wasn't still holding it all together. Jude verse, uh, chapter 1, verse 24 and 25. There's only one chapter in Jude, so sometimes people are like, ah, Jude 24. You're like, there's 24. No, there's just verse 24 and 25 of Jude says this. It says, now all glory to God, who is able to keep you from falling away and will bring you with great joy into his glorious presence without a single fault. All glory to him who alone is God, our Savior, through Jesus Christ our Lord. All glory, majesty, power, and authority are his before all time. Why? Because he existed before time. He created time and now is sovereign still over time. He holds, he created all of this before all time in the present and beyond all time. Amen. Jesus is the sovereign king who is reigning over nature. He, he reigns over nature. And when we see Jesus walking on the water, that's not just a really cool party trick. And the lake wasn't frozen. <laughs> he, he who created every molecular structure in the known universe was sitting there saying, hey, I need to get to my boys. Let's take the shortest distance. Let's roll this way. Be, because he does have some authority and power over nature in doing some things. And so it's important for us to re realize this truth. We worship a God who was before all, who is in all, created all, for all, and within all things. And I know that might be a lot to unpack and a lot to get your mind around and a lot to grab a hold of, but I think we need to start with that point that Jesus is the king who reigns sovereign over nature. And it's interesting that in his rule and reign that his disciples themselves experienced storms. They, ex they were right in the middle of a pretty intense storm. The flourishing life of an apprentice to Jesus is not void of storms, friends. This is what, what we see. He's walking to them in the middle of a storm. This storm is raging. The flourishing life of an apprentice to Jesus, of a disciple, of a follower, of a Christian, of a believer, of a Bible-believing, Bible-confessing, power-praying person still is going to experience storms. The Christian life is definitely this mixture of faith, sometimes fear, sometimes doubt, but yet still a pursuit. No one lives on the mountaintop of perfect faith. I don't care how many Bible verses you've memorized. I don't care how long you've been in church. 
I don't care if you can pray in tongues or not pray in tongues. I don't, I don't care how many miracles you've seen, how many demons you've casted out. I, you are not living, nor will you live, on the mountaintop of perfect faith. Void of problems and void of pain. No, you will experience pain. You will experience disappointment. You will experience death. You and I will experience discouragement and sometimes the deepest, most devastating disappointments. But that doesn't mean your life can't flourish and it doesn't mean that you're not an apprentice to Jesus. I've heard it said before that God doesn't promise us salvation from death in this life, in storms, in tragedies, while you're riding on an airplane. But he does promise us salvation after death. In other words, there are storms and you will experience them. You will experience pain. We, faith is not a denial of the reality of what you're walking through. You want me to say it again? Faith is not a denial of the pain, of the sickness, of the trouble, of the disappointment, of the discouragement, of the depression, of the anxiety that you're walking through. Faith is not a denial of those things, but rather it is a choice to stay loyal to Jesus in the midst of those things. And if you've been handed a faith that says your life will be perfect, you won't experience storms, and you can li- you're, you're going to live in such a way that nothing bad will ever happen to you, I am sorry you have been sold something that is not biblically true. Because Jesus himself said, take heart, you will have trouble. But I've overcome. And you're going to overcome. You're going to walk through. You're going to make it through. Listen, I want you to, don't, don't miss this point. The very fact that they were in a storm was a result of their obedience to Jesus. Who told them to get in the boat? Yeah, very good. Very good. It's, y'all are so, y'all had some coffee this morning. Yeah. Jesus told them to get in the boat. In their obedience to God, they experienced a storm that made them doubt. Storms are not indicative of punishment. Storms are not even indicative of disobedience. Sometimes storms come because storms come. And when I say storms, I'm talking about pain, I'm talking about sickness, I'm talking about disappointment, I'm talking about doubts, I'm talking about discouragement, I'm talking about dark times, I'm talking about anything that feels out of control that makes you a little worried, makes you a little fearful, makes you a little bit, gets the heart rate going a little bit gets a little frustrated, gets you a little bit, what is going on in this world? And and I want you to know that the disciples in their obedience got in the boat, and I love what it says. It says they were fighting the waves. They were fighting it. They weren't just sitting back and like, well, must be the will of the Lord. Let me just sit here and not... Just take it all in. I guess I'll have to do this. No, like, like they were like, man, the sails grabbed it. Like some Peter was probably yelling a bunch of orders. Come on, guys, let's go. They were fighting. This, they were standing their ground. They were doing all they could do to stand. But the storm was still raging around them. Friends, when storms rage in our life, we need to do all that we can do and allow God to do all he can do. We, we get to participate in this again. They, they weren't sitting there idle. They were active. They weren't passive, just suffering in pain. They were active in finding a solution. That's an act of faith. That's remaining loyal and committed and faithful to Jesus even when storms come. And that's what we do in the life uh, uh, as disciples. Listen, notice this. They were not in unfamiliar territory. It's not like this was the first time they ever row, row, rowed their boat gently down the Sea of Galilee. <laughs> These were skilled 
professional fishermen, men of the sea. Arr, like they, they had some skill, but yet we're still terrified. They were in familiar territory. They had likely faced storms before, but the storm still raged. Listen, can I, can I say something to some of you? Your skill set, your intellect, and your gifting is no match for when the spirit of fear shows up in your life. When the spirit of fear starts creeping into your life, it doesn't matter how strong you are, how much you can bench press, how knowledgeable you are, how rational you are, how skilled at navigating whatever it is in your life that you are. When the spirit of fear shows up, you are no match. Your skills and your ability are no match. You need a spiritual solution to a spiritual problem. I believe the disciples were experiencing a little bit of a spirit of fear. And when, when fear shows up... Often we either fight or we have flight. Anytime fear shows up. And there's some healthy things as it relates to this sense of fear, right? Sometimes it's important that you would, I might be afraid, but I'm going to, man, I'm going to do something here. There, there's an important, they were fighting the waves. They weren't flighting it, they were fighting it. Sometimes we experience fear and we're like, yeah, I don't, I don't think I'm going to do that. Like, stove hot. I'm afraid to touch it. Very good. Very, very good. That's smart. But sometimes fear shows up and it cripples us. And your skill is no match for it. One of the areas that the spirit of fear shows up speaking something to me in my life is in the area of finances. Can, can I get, just get really vulnerable for a minute? When, when it comes to financial things, I can easily find myself listening to the spirit of fear. As a pastor with staff members who like their paychecks, and then all of a sudden we go through like a year period where nobody can show up in a building, and financial things are facing, and I'm thinking about things like the spirit of fear can show up in our lives. I have skills. I mean, I could, I, I'm pretty decent with words. <laughs> I'm, I'm decently skilled at communicating vision, rallying people, moving us in a direction. It's kind of a bit of a skill for me. But my ability to cast vision and communicate the gospel and to help you find life and health and flourish in the area of your finances doesn't keep me from experiencing the spirit of fear. One of the scariest decisions I remember making was that we stopped passing an offering plate every Sunday. I took control away even more from the skills. There are a lot of churches every Sunday, and it's not wrong. They will stand up and tell you the truth about what the Bible says, and then they will pass an offering plate. Nothing wrong with that at all. We don't do that, though. Why? Because we're walking in a different obedience to what God has said to do. And some of it has been an intentional course correction away from walking in fear and instead push it, putting our faith in Jesus. But your skill set is no match when the spirit of fear shows up. Second Timothy 1, 6 through 7 says it like this. This is why I remind you to fan into flames the spiritual gift. What kind of gift? spiritual gift that God gave you when I laid my hands on you Timothy for God has not given you a spirit of what fear but one instead of power of love and of self-discipline or a sound mind this is what God has given to us to be an antidote to fight the spirit of fear that's coming into your life. Listen, fear is a prophesying spirit trying to convince you of your future void of God's power, void of his love, and void of his peace in your life. And so when you find yourself thinking about things again and again and again, 
that are void of God's love, void of his power at work, and void of his peace, his presence, his soundness of your mind, then you are experiencing the spirit of fear stirring some things. And it doesn't matter how good, how good you are, how smart you are, and how much people like you, doggone it, you need a spiritual weapon, and that's Jesus. And there is a spirit of God that can grow in you stronger than the spirit of fear that's trying to surround you. Here's the last kind of observation I want to make from today's passage, and then I'm going to get really practical for you. And that's this. When you watch the wind, it will cause you to walk without faith. Ecclesiastes 11, 4 through 7 says it like this. Farmers who wait for perfect weather will never plant. If they watch every cloud, they'll never harvest. Just as you cannot understand the paths of the wind or the mysteries of a tiny baby growing in its mother's womb, you cannot understand the activity of God who does all things. So plant your seed in the morning and keep busy all afternoon for you don't know if, it prof- if profit will come from one activity or the other or maybe both. When you're facing storms, stop watching the wind and participate in walking in faith. If you're always trying to watch the weather of circumstances, trying to predict what's going to happen in the community based on the last board meeting, trying to figure out the best way to get your kids to X, Y, and Z, if you're always watching circumstances, you're not going to walk in faith. You just won't do it. If we're always watching the wind, what happened to Peter? His eyes were on Jesus. He was walking towards Jesus. What is faith? We've talked about this so many times. I, please, please, I hope you're getting this finally. Faith starts with repentance. Instead of going my own direction or towards the ways of the world, I repent and I turn around and I decide I'm going to walk towards Jesus. So in my walking towards Jesus, I am living and growing in a loyal allegiance to Jesus. Loyal allegiance to Jesus, i.e. faith. Faith is not some emotional agreement. Faith is not an intellectual alignment of doctrine. Faith is an embodied loyalty to Jesus. Should I say it again? I will. Faith is an embodied loyalty to Jesus. It is not a disembodied sense of feeling, sense of hope, sense of wishfulness, sense of biblical morality. Biblical faith is an embodied belief, an embodied loyalty towards Jesus, to walk towards Jesus. And if I'm walking towards Jesus, I'm not worried about the winds and the storms. But when I start looking at the storms, I'm going to start walking oh come on are you getting it if you're watching the wind and the storms and this and that and you're worried and what about this and oh my gosh I got this diagnosis and I got this thing and I got this thing going on and my kids are doing this and I've got this my bank account reads this and I see no rain and no rain has showed up but I need a lot of rain I need a whole lot more rain come on God where's the rain clouds I'm watching the clouds I'm looking to see no no what you need is a word from God that will move you from idle to faithful I think sometimes we dog Peter because he started to drown. How oh, Peter, so foolish. I can't believe it, Peter. Always making mistakes, drowning right there, need Jesus to save you. He got out the boat. Like the 11 other sissies. He got out the boat. Did he walk on water? Yes or yes? yes? Very good. Very good. Sometimes we need to be willing to make a move in obedience based on 51% assurance. 51% is better than 49%. And sometimes you're not going to have 100%. Is this going to work? Is this right? Is this the truth? Is this the... Sometimes 51% of, I'm pretty sure that was Jesus. 
I'm pretty sure he said to move. I'm pretty sure I can do this. I don't know that I got it all figured out, but I think I can start reading my Bible a little bit and trust it. I might not know all of the things, and I might not know all that. I can at least start somewhere. I might, I might not have all of my life 100% together, but I'm 50, 51% sure I'm going to heaven, so I'm going to start inviting people to come to church. I'm not 100% sure how prayer, and I'm not really good at prayer and all these things, but I'm going to pray the prayer anyways, because I'm 50% sure that God's here in my prayer. Come on, am I, am I speaking to anybody right now? Sometimes we sit there, it's like, I'm, I think I'm going to make the phone call. Make the phone call. I think I'm going to start the business. Start the business. Well, I'm not sure. What if it's a bad time in the economy to start? 51% from a word from God is still walking in faith rather than being crippled by fear to never get your booty out the boat. The question then, how do we have a faith that looks like that? How, How do we have a faith that says no to the spirit of fear but yes to the voice of God? How do we have faith that says, even when the storms are raging, I'm going to keep fighting these winds till Jesus shows up? How do we have that kind of faith? How, how do we have that kind of faith? I'm going to give you three things, and they're super simple, super elementary, and I guarantee you've heard them before. But you need to be reminded of them. I need to remind myself of them. Number one, here's this. How do, we, how do we develop that kind of loyal faith and loyal allegiance to Jesus when we go through these storms? Number one, prayer. It anchors us in God's love. Prayer anchors you in God's love. Jesus went by himself to pray. Jesus modeled what prayer looks like. This Wednesday, you have an opportunity to come, 7 o'clock, spend 45 minutes with other followers of Jesus, praying and worshiping. We call it First Wednesday Prayer. Why? Because we pray together on the first Wednesday of every month. (laughs) We're brilliant, aren't we? Just (sighs) come and pray. Practice it. Last Sunday, in the elementary space, our small group leaders with our kids, you know what they were doing? Giving the kids an opportunity to pray. Why? Because prayer takes practice. But I'm not really good at prayer. Are you 51% not bad at prayer? Like, try it. Listen, listen. I want to set somebody free. Save me, Lord, is a complete sentence. (laughs) It's also a complete prayer. Help me, Lord complete sentence I believe but help my unbelief give me faith today be with me today show me your love today complete sentences perfectly acceptable prayers pray because prayer anchors you in God's love when you pray eliminate distractions when you pray talk out loud no mental silent prayers no more Use words. God gave you big boy words. Use them. Use your words. Doesn't have to be loud. Oh Lord, save my kids today. Like, let's just say it loud enough that you can hear it. When you pray, close off distractions, pray out loud, be still, listen. And for many of you, You need to pray in the spirit. Yes, I believe in a heavenly prayer language. I do believe it is available for every person who believes and wants to receive it. And sometimes it takes a great amount of time of discipleship to learn that. But I do believe it's available and I do think you need to do it. And if you don't believe me, just go read Jude 17 through 25 and you'll discover that one of the primary things that praying in tongues, praying in the spirit does is it builds your faith. 
on the way here, I prayed in the Spirit. This morning at 5.45, I started praying in the Spirit. While we were worshiping, I was praying in the Spirit. All throughout the week, I pray in the Spirit. I pray in English, and I pray in the Spirit. Why? Because I need to be anchored in the love of God, and so I'm going to pray. Pray, 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 pray. It anchors us in God's love. But what if I'm not doing it right? What if you're doing it right? Just talk to the Lord. And it begins to anchor you in his love. Here, here's number two. Prayer anchors us in the love of God. How do we cultivate this loyalty and this faith? And number two, scripture. It's what feeds your courage. Jesus said to the disciples, take courage. He didn't say receive courage. Different action. Take courage. Let me say it another way. Take God's word and read it. God's word will give you courage. It fuels your faith. It strengthens you. It gives you God's perspective on things. It feeds your courage. Listen, input equals output. Really elementary. I told you it's basic, and I've told you you've heard it before. Input is what produces the output. If what is outputting from your life is worry, fear, anxiety, sadness, waffling, indecisiveness, you are not feeding on God's word enough. You need to feast on God's word. Forget hocus pocus too. Get in the holy scriptures more. My kids keep waking up with nightmares. Find one of the seven unused devices in your house. Download the Bible app. Open up Psalms and click read out loud and let it play all night in their room so their ears and their spirits can hear the word of God all night long. Why? Because God's word feeds you courage. Some of you are like, shoot, I'm not doing that for my kids. I'm doing that for me. Good. Start. Read God's word and it will feed your Courage. You have to take courage. The word spoken from Jesus is the words on these pages. It will bring life to you. You can go to our website and on our central hub, there's a thing there called Soap 2.0 or daily reading. There's two cards there that'll take you and teach you how to have a daily time in God's word, listening and reading and retaining it and writing it. it, it get it in your heart. Take courage. Get God's word in you. Change the inputs. So that what's coming out isn't fear and worry and anxiety and stress and frustration. Feed yourself something different so what comes out is different. Scripture feeds our courage. And then finally, here's the last one. We've got prayer. We've got scripture. Any brilliant scholar want to guess what the third one might be? Yeah, worship. Worship. Three essentials to having a healthy faith, prayer, the word, and worship. Worship moves your gaze toward God, Father, Son, and Spirit. Let me say it another way. Worship moves your gaze from the winds to the one who is worthy of our worship. What did the disciples do? They fell down and worshiped Jesus. They saw what he did. They saw what he did. And they were like, you know what? We have got to stop looking and wondering and worrying. And we need to start worshiping Jesus. 
<laughs> he said, why do you have so little faith? You know what's so funny to me? If I were to look at some of you and say, why do you have so little faith? You would get offended and never show up again. Jesus was simply articulating the problem and they discovered the right solution. You're right. We were really worried. We've been fearful and afraid. I need to shift my gaze. I'm watching the wind and I need to worship the Savior. Worship shifts your focus. It changes your eyesight. It shifts your perspective. It widens it. It widens it. It widens it. Don't walk away from Jesus in the midst of the storm. Worship him in the midst of the storm. God, you reign above it all. You reign above it all. Over the universe and every living thing. You reign above it all, Lord. You're worthy of it all, Lord. The Bible teaches us about praise and it teaches us about worship. Praise is not fast songs and worship slow songs. Praise are songs that tell the story of God working in our lives. Worship describes attributes of God that he alone is worthy for. Praise tells the story of what God has done, has a little bit to do with who we are, what it, how it impacts us, how he's changed us. Worship is all about him. It's directed to him. It describes who he is, his attributes, and the truth of him. It is all about him. Both are necessary in your life to strengthen your faith. Worship will strengthen your faith too because it puts your eyes in the right place. Let me ask you a question. What have you been watching lately? Have you been watching the winds of circumstances, the winds of your life, the winds of culture, the winds of the landscape, the winds of what's happening in your family? Or are you watching Jesus? Are you looking to Jesus? Are, are you worshiping Jesus? Take courage, take heart. Storms will come, but Jesus comes to us even in our storms. Amen? Would you stand as we come to a moment of just response to the Lord? Would you just bow your heads, close your eyes, just kind of quiet your own heart for a minute. Just simply ask the Lord, Holy Spirit, what are you saying to me today? Is there some inputs that you need to change? Some worship that you need to engage in? There's some prayer time that you need to practice? What's God saying to you today? Jesus, today we declare that you reign above it all, that you are worthy and holy. You are Jesus, our King, and you reign sovereign over nature. So today, Lord, would you seal these words in our hearts, strengthening us, encouraging us? Would you help us to take courage this week, to worship you, to, to be anchored in your love this week, Jesus? Lord, would you help our eyes stay on you and not on the winds when they start raging? Help us to fight it. To, to, to be right there, to stay faithful in it. I thank you, Lord, for it. And now, Lord, I just speak this blessing and benediction over our friends and family today from Jude, verse 20 and 25, 24 and 25. Now to him who is able to keep you this week from stumbling, the one who is able to keep you and present you blameless before his very presence for his glory and great joy. To the only God, our Savior, through Jesus Christ, our Lord, to you be glory, to you be majesty, Jesus, to you be the dominion, to you all authority in our lives. Before all time, both now and forever, we pray. And the people of God said, amen. Hey.
Hey, friends and family, I hope today's message was life-giving for you. I want to ask you to take a next step and go ahead and click the subscribe button so you never miss another chance to have an encounter with God. And while you're at it, take another step and share it with a friend. Maybe post it on your social network or text a coworker the link. And when you do that, you are partnering and get to be a part of seeing faith come to life in them. Hey, if Faith Church has made an impact in your life, if these messages are helping you gain traction in your faith, would you consider partnering with us financially? When you do that, it helps us widen our reach so that more people can have an encounter with the real Jesus. You can find information and ways to give on our central hub, faithchurchks.org. If you're If you live in the Southeast Kansas region, we'd love to see it in person at one of our Sunday services. You can find those times on our hub as well, faithchurchks.org. Hey, remember this, God is for you and we love you.